Well, good morning, children. This is your favorite Sunday school teacher, third vice president of Usher Board number four here at New Zion Missionary Baptist Church, K. Edward Copeland. This is the day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Grateful to God for this opportunity, and as we come in our digital space, as always, I want you to chime in, want you to check in, let us know how you're doing. Today, I want to know, aside from how you're doing, uh, what have you celebrated recently? And when I say celebrate, some of you might have celebrated a birthday, some anniversary, but you know, it's all right to celebrate just any kind of good news. Maybe you got some good, maybe you got some good grades, maybe you got some good news, maybe you're just celebrating good weather. Today, let's focus on what we're celebrating, what we're so grateful to God for that we're celebrating. And I want you to sort of search your heart and mind for some of the unusual things, not unusual, some of the things he does sort of on a regular basis that you don't celebrate. It might be an uh, anniversary on a job that you prayed for, it might be you got some type of uh, certification or raise, whatever it is, let's celebrate God today as we come into this digital space, go ahead and type into the comment section uh, how you're doing today and exactly what it is that you're celebrating. Let us know if we're coming through. It seems like we're coming through clear uh, today. I, I hope, <laughs> I pray. So check in with us, even as you uh, get settled in. And today we're going to uh, continue on in our little series We've been talking about wisdom, skill in godly living, and last week we looked at the book of James chapter 1. Today we'll look at James chapter 2, but I need you to check in. Uh, well, congratulations. The Parks are celebrating their 37th wedding anniversary, and we praise God for them. Thank God for all that they mean to us they're doing for us what are you celebrating tell me how we can celebrate with you the bible says we ought to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice we can't rejoice with you unless you we know <clears throat> what you're rejoicing about and we want to rejoice with you that is not to discount if you're having a bad day and maybe you're weeping that's why i'm asking uh, check in if you're having a bad day let us know and we'll pray with you and pray for you as it relates to that. Two, I'm, let's see, I've had such an eventful week. I don't know where, where I've been, what I've been doing. Uh, what was I? Oh, yeah, Harris, I was in um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania <laughs> yesterday talking to about, I don't know, it's probably about a, a good 150 college students and I just celebrate God for what he's uh, doing in places that I've never been. Uh, did you know that there are people you've never met who love God and God is doing great things in their lives? And so I'm grateful to God that he's allowed me, oh, actually over the last two weekends, because I was, uh, what was that? University of North Carolina uh, with Dr. Ali Watts. Let me, wait a minute, let me celebrate Dr. Ali Watts Davis, she is she won the Lifetime Achievement Award for the National Association of Teachers. I think that sounds right. Monica, do you I see my sister on here? Do I have that right? Uh, I know she got the Lifetime Achievement Award. And if I'm not mistaken, the organization is NAT, National Organization of Teachers, something like that. So we celebrate. Um, uh, our great friend, Dr. Ali Watts Davis. And if there are any members from Grace Fellowship that are in class this morning, go ahead and uh, give me the accurate, the precise name of the Lifetime Achievement Award that she received. I'm grateful to God, uh, Joshua Patterson. I didn't read the article, but it came across my little thing. Wasn't they on in the Rockford Register Star? Uh, for the great work they've been doing, these young men, literally 10 years ago, 
He said, we're going to do some things, and I'll be doggone if they hadn't done exactly what they said they were going to do. I, I miss those times. As a matter of fact, we need to have a reunion. Fellas used to come over to the house. We sit and chop it up. And now this one is a, a representative. That one owns a coffee house. These ones are uh, doing developments in the community, all those types of things. So we celebrate you. Dr. Davis, can you tell us what the name of the organization, I think I don't have it right, is Lifetime Achievement Award for the National Association of Teachers? That doesn't sound right. <laughs> that can't be right. <laughs> Children, put, put in there what we're supposed to celebrate <laughs> so I can get on to my lesson. While you're doing that, open up your Bible to James chapter 2. We're just walking through the book of James as we try to get some godly wisdom. And wow, last week, man, that seems like uh, eternity ago, we were looking at uh, the calculus of joy and uh, dealing with trials and temptations, all those types of things. And this week, we're picking up on something that he left off on in last week's uh, session. I'm waiting for everybody to make sure you get checked in. I'm ready to go. Did anybody ever give me the correct information <laughs> for Dr. Davis's Lifetime Achievement <laughs> Award? Anyway, whatsoever it was, it's a, it's a national, international organization, and she got the uh, Lifetime Achievement as <laughs> she richly deserves. So we thank God for you. Let's, let's jump in here at James chapter 2. I'm going to read, um, let's do it uh, this way, uh, sort of frame it. Now, you remember at the end of chapter 1, James uh, says something interesting. He points out that We need to be not just hearers, but doers of the word. And if you think yourself to be religious and you don't know how to control your tongue, you're lying to yourself. And whatever brand that religion is that you have is useless. So now he's going to expand on that here in chapter two. I don't know how more timely this could be. I don't I mean, as I'm reading this. As we get into it today, I don't know if I'm reading the newspaper or reading the Bible, or if I'm reading both at the same time and they're intersecting with one another, which is actually the case. Because what he's going to argue today in chapter 2 is for us not to get caught up in useless religion, a useless faith, and a useless faith, a illegitimate faith of faith that really doesn't line up with the authentic um, expression of Christianity that the Lord is calling, to, calling us to and that the Bible describes. He says a useless faith knows how to talk a good game but don't know how to walk a good game. That a useless faith is caught up in appearances and won't address its own prejudice, its own biases, its own discriminatory practices. Lord, help us today. He, now, let's, let's start uh, walking through this thing. He ends chapter 1, verse 27, by saying, uh, and by the, by the way, when I say he ends the chapter, remember that James didn't write this letter in chapters. Uh, scholars over the years have put chapter and verse so it would be easier for us as we're studying together be, to be able to locate certain passages. But when James wrote this letter, it wasn't broken down into chapters and verses. It's just one letter. And as a matter of fact, if you uh, take your time, you really could read this whole letter in like five to seven minutes easily, just going at a leisurely pace. So even though in our Bibles there's a break between uh, chapter 1, verse 27, and chapter 2, verse 1, 
he's just continuing on with his argument. And basically, what he gets at, it says, now look, pure and undefiled religion, this is chapter 1, verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God or before the Father, old King James says, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is very interesting. I had great dialogue with college students about this yesterday, that very often in Christianity, we, we gravitate or our temperaments or our denominations gravitate toward one thing or another, either this idea of holiness, keeping yourself unstained, unspotted from the world, or this idea of service. And sometimes the way we frame it, particularly in America, they became, become mutually exclusive. And so some people get in their little Christian enclaves. They uh, hang out with only Christians. You know, they pull their uh, children from the uh, public schools and go to private school or homeschool. And I'm, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm talking about why are you doing that? Some people do that because they don't want to. Um, they don't want to be in contact at all with the world because from their perspective, the world is so corrupt, so, so polluted that, hey, I'm just going to withdraw myself and we're going to be over here in our little compound. Others uh, cast a side eye at them and say, well, but you're not doing anything in the community. And they're all about service and Jesus help people. Matter of fact, did you see that uh, ad during the football, uh, during the Super Bowl, where it's like uh, various expressions where people were washing uh, other people's feet or serving them. And some people, particularly from this angle, were like incensed. If you look at the Christian sort of, um, what do you call it? Uh, not Twitter sphere, but uh, the Christian online sort of digital space, you saw a very marked contrast because some were casting, man, they were saying that the ad was demonic and this, that, and the other. And all it was showing was like people <laughs> serving people. And they say, yeah, but the way it was showing it and this, that, and the other, and you know, you're not holy and blah, 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 blah. When in point of fact, the Bible is very clear there's not an either or thing that is a both hand. And he's going to make a specific argument here in chapter two as he gets at this idea that true religion has some signs. It shows up certain ways. It's not just what you talk, it's how you walk. It's not just uh, what you believe about God, but how you treat other people. And so he's going to work all that out for us, but I want you to see at the beginning the tension that is not in the text, but the tension that is in our experience as it relates to being Christians in these yet-to-be United States. And that uh, football ad was just the latest sort of example of uh, sort of different camps and how they sort of view things and how we've divorced some things that the Bible marries Verse 27 of chapter 1 of James, if you're going to live wisely as a Christian, you got to learn that pure and undefiled religion, from God's perspective, that's what the scripture says, verse 27, from God's perspective, this is what he's looking for, that you take care of the marginalized, the vulnerable, the least, uh, the left out, but at the same time, you recognize the responsibility of holiness, that you keep yourself unstained and unspotted from the world. It's not an either or, it's a both and uh, type of situation where we're not to be isolated, but, but insulated. When I was growing up around this time of year, my sister can testify to this, we didn't get to necessarily eat what we wanted to eat for breakfast or what we preferred. No, mama gonna give us some oatmeal and or cream of wheat or grits or, what we used to eat, maypole, uh, I think that's what it's called, malto meal. They used to have all kind of different hot cereals. Why? Because we live here in the upper Midwest and it's winter time. So what would we do? Not only would we have to eat that because uh, she wanted something hot in our stomachs. She wanted something that was going to stick to our ribs. 
but then we also had to dress appropriately. Why? Because we're going out into a um, we're going out to into a cold environment. I said all that to say that what Mama did is what God expects of us, and that is not to withdraw from the environment, but to be insulated by having not something but someone down on the inside and having the whole armor of God so that we can go into dark and unsavory places. So I want to be clear. Listen, I'm not casting dispersion on those who um, have their children in a private school. Maybe that's the best education that you can provide or that you decide to homeschool. But that's great. But what, I, what I'm also saying is we need to equip, equip our children whatever way we're uh, pursuing their education, we need to equip them to be able to live in this dark and unsavory world. And if you are discipling them, if you are putting something down on the inside, if you're instilling scripture, if you're uh, praying with them, teaching them the disciplines of the Christian life, if you're helping them to put the whole armor of God on, then it doesn't matter if they're homeschooling or uh, public school or whatever, because you have insulated them to be pure and unspotted in this dirty world. And at the same time, you got to help them to recognize that they're supposed to make a contribution. God has given every Christian a gift. Every gift is supposed to be used in ministry. Therefore, every Christian is called to ministry. And all ministry is not within the confines of a church. It's good. They serve on the usher board. They serve in the choir. They serve in here. They serve there. But what are they doing in the community? What have you taught your children about what real religion is? Am I reading my Bible right? You look in your Bible. Maybe mine is wrong. Mine says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father, God and Father, our God and Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. That ain't just something you do in church. That's going out and, uh, you know, I appreciate it here at, the, at New Zion before the pandemic. We used to go out regularly to the nursing homes and, you know, go visit uh, this one and go visit that one and stuff like that. Why? Because that's what we need to train our children up in. Because that's what pure religion is from God. That's what the that's the type of religion from God's perspective that He's looking for. Now in chapter two, He's going to go into something that <laughs> God ain't looking for. That unfortunately is the hallmark, the characteristic of our current age. Let's look at this first part. Uh, let me read chapter 2, verses 1 through, let's just stop at 7. Really, the chapter divides like 1 through 13 and then 14 through 26. In the first part, 1 through 13, he's talking about the sin of partiality, the sin of prejudice. That prejudice is a sin. Discrimination is a sin. And he's going to use examples. And then in chapter 2, verse 14, all the way through 26, he's going to talk about uh, a dead faith, a useless faith, and sort of how to work that out. So let's just read verses 1 through 8 first. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus with an attitude of personal favoritism. And this is very interesting, that he starts out by having just talked about Okay, here's what real religion looks like. Here's what real spirituality, real Christianity looks like. That you hold intention, righteousness and mercy. It, you hold intention, holiness and uh, service. That you hold intention, the fact that I can be in the world and not of the world. And at the same time that my true expression of my commitment to God is how, is how I treat other people. It's going to come out on how I treat, treat other people. Come here, John. I'm not saying this right. Well, how can you say you love God whom you have not seen? This is First John chapter 4. And then here your brother and you're looking at him and he, and he is poor and, and doesn't have what he needs and you're just walking by him. He said, no, no, you're lying. You can't say that you love God and you haven't seen him and you hate your brother and you're sitting there looking right at him. That ain't how that thing works. So he goes on here to say, here's what I'm talking about. Don't let your life be characterized by prejudice. Recognize your biases 
and deal with those things. Now, what we know is that all of us have some unconscious biases. That is, we look at people a, a particular way and we make certain assumptions about them. Now, he's going to use a specific example here. Let's look at the example that he uses. He says, chapter 2, verse 2, he says, if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. You say to the poor man, you stand over there. Or, or, you sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do not, pardon me, do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called. Now, notice the scenario. He says, here's what I'm talking about when I say the sin of partiality, the sin of favoritism, prejudice, or biases. Two guys walking to church. Here come G, Mr. GQ. You all dressed up. And you said, bro, come sit up front. Come sit up, up here near the, uh, so they can see you on the stream, so, they can, <laughs> so you can be in the camera angle. Here come this, uh, this homeless-looking fella smelling stinking got some alcohol uh on his breath and you, you you are a christian so he can come in but you say now you sit uh, listen you get out of the camera angle you go uh, go matter of fact don't even sit you go stand over there or if you're gonna sit uh, here in the uh, translation it says uh, uh sit down by my footstool or in other words sit here uh, at my feet that is in a, a position of a slave, the position of a, of a servant. Now notice in the Jewish sort of tradition, in the Jewish law, that everybody was supposed to be either sitting together or standing together. But here it is, because the rich man has come in, he can get a special seat, and the poor man, you got to stand. For, for, number one, that goes even against their own law, but the real issue is what made you make the distinction the only thing that you could go by was their appearance and you made some assumptions about them really this is what it's getting at you're making assumptions about the character and the morality of somebody based on how they look on the outside now in this context he's talking about uh, rich and poor and it's very interesting when you think about how we deal with people that we have in general, a love-hate relationship with rich people that uh, everybody want to be rich, but then we look at rich people a certain way. We, we want to achieve their lifestyle or we aspire. That's what Instagram and, you know, used to be magazines are, are, are sort of um, geared toward. So we look at the little, whatever the magazine is, and we see people dressed a certain way and oh we're gonna be like that or whatever but at the same time we rail against the rich this is very interesting how so many and I'm, I'm not making a political statement right now but I'm, I'm trying to point out a biblical dynamic that we see playing out very starkly in our country and that is that people think that this man uh, the, the former president is on their side. He's for the little man. But <laughs> he owns Trump Towers and he's just been convicted of fraud, defraud and this, that, and other. He's rich. But really what it is, it's not, the problem isn't uh, uh, former President Trump. The problem is this insidious sort of perspective that we have that we ascribe certain characteristics to people based upon their social economic status. So he can say anything foul that he wants to say, do anything that he wants to do, and people will buy his little tennis shoes for what, $400 that are gold tennis shoes. 
and poor people will pay for them. He'll say, I need you to help me stop the steal. Now, again, I'm not trying to be political. I'm trying to point out how this, this scripture is playing out in our country right now because people think and ascribe certain characteristics to people based on their socioeconomic status. So here's this poor person. And so back in the 80s, Reagan, he sort of rode on this wave of welfare queens, and we got to get rid of these welfare queens. And in a lot of people's mind, they had some person of color when, when he said welfare kings and math queens, and they would even have commercials. We would always be wealth, it would always be people of color that they would show. But when you look at the statistics, there's more white people on welfare than there are black, and they're actually voting against their own interests. And so when Obama was trying to get Obamacare through and all these types of things, people were like, well, we don't want that. We they had, in their prejudiced minds, they voted against their own interests. Why don't you want everybody? To have access, people in other countries look at us like we're crazy. Like, why? Okay, you don't have universal health care. Why don't your people want everybody to have access to health care? Is this an attitude of bias, of prejudice, of personal favoritism? Because we ascribe certain characteristics to people based upon how we view their outward appearance. Now, social economic status is one of those things that goes across ethnicity. Listen to what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to be very clear right here that it's not just a race problem. It's a sin problem because sometimes we look at people who are rich and we just think they're right because they're rich and they just as foul as they want to be. Or we look at people who are poor and say, you must have done something yourself. It's because you're lazy. It's because you're this. It's because you're that. And they work harder than, than three or four of us. They got four or five jobs, but how can you live on the living? How can you make a how can you live off of the, what we call it, the minimum wage that we have in this country? And so we make assumptions, and then sometimes we flip it. Sometimes we, we think that just because somebody is uh, lacking that they uh, must be righteous, and that uh, because somebody is rich, they must be wicked. When in point of fact, there are Christian rich people who are doing all kinds of things. I don't know if... Uh, I don't know if he's a Christian, but for example, uh, Warren Buffett for years has been trying to give away money and trying to do this. And, uh, you know, there's a collection. I forgot what they call him, but there's a group of rich people that basically got together and said, man, we rich. We need to do better than this. We need to give more money. Let's solve this problem. Let's do this. Let's do that. And if you look down through history, there's been tremendous activity uh, in terms of helping to start schools, helping to start hospitals and all these types of things from people who were rich, but they were righteous. And then there are people who are poor, who are wicked, because righteousness and wickedness is not connected to your socioeconomic status. But we have a way of trying to do that. So here this devil come in dressed sweetly. And we say, come on in. Matter of fact, we'll make you, we'll put you on the trustee board. And here this uh, poor fella come in, it's a homeless fella. Well, oh, poor fella, you know, you go sit over there or vice versa. Here it is. Somebody is rich and we don't we don't trust them. And so uh, we don't let them sort of sort of get in our circle. And that might be a, a, a righteous person who really loves God. And then we say, well, oh, we just want all the poor people. And he come in and he uh, uh, messing with the women, doing all kind of foul stuff, because we're, here's my point. The point is that we look on the outside, but God wants us to look on the inside and that the social economic status of a person, wait a minute, the race or ethnicity of a person, a person's, uh, whether they're male or female, uh, you know, with their educational status, none of those things that we use in order to rank people are legitimate ways for us to assess their character it's not and see we love to we love to quote him but we don't want to do anything that he talked about dr martin luther king says 
It's something about being judged by the content of our character as opposed to the color of our skin. And so now we got even famous pastors saying, well, he what we got famous pastors because of prejudice and discrimination and because of favoritism and because they don't want to deal with their sort of secret sins of racial bias. We got famous pastors and I, I won't call no name because I don't want to get uh, incensed because I got to preach today. Uh, talking about, well, Martin Luther King wasn't even saved, uh, but then same, that same pastor treats Trump like he's a savior. Why? Because of what I'm reading right now. Because we don't want to deal with that. And again, it's not all just race. Sometimes it's social economic status. Sometimes we are prejudiced against people because they're male or female. Sometimes we're prejudiced against them uh, because of their age. Uh, I've been dealing with some uh, young executives here recently, sometimes uh, particularly women who look younger than they actually are, are very often discounted on the job and treated a certain way. So even with that, when we just talk about the pay gap, what is that about? It's about what we're talking about. That's a sin. When you're treating people and ascribing certain characteristics to them based on your perception of their outward appearance and not actually taking a look at what's going on. So he makes the argument that when you treat people like that, you're doing, it's showing your evil motives. Look at verse uh, four. He says, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? And you judging the wrong stuff. You looking at people, now let's make some practical applications about this because I got to get off of this. All the context in which we're talking about is pure and undefiled religion, a, 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 a useful faith versus a useless and dead faith. We're going to talk about dead faith in a minute. But notice what he's saying here. He's getting at this idea of not judging, not prejudging people just because you've ascribed certain characteristics to them based on their appearance. Now, let's make practical application in our personal relationships. How many of us have gotten caught up in bad situations because he looked good, she looked good? <laughs> yeah, but what about their character? You don't look at... <laughs> recognize that we all have biases. That we all have some preconceived notions of people based upon their appearance. You know? Uh, if somebody looks good to you, sometimes you'll blow past some yellow flags and even some red flags because he looked good. <laughs> he got big muscles. He, got, he's, he looked good. Oh, he keep himself together. Biggest devil you ever didn't seen. And then here, here this little fellow over here, you know, he ain't got no special characteristics. He's kind of short, ain't got no big muscles. Most loving joker that God has ever created. And so you just look past him because y'all don't look good on Instagram. You think about how y'all going to pose. <laughs> and then fool around and then got your heart broke six times in a row because you keep getting connected with the same joker just got the different name. And you wonder what's going on. This. <laughs> you looking on the outside instead of asking God, Lord, show me who this person is. Show me their heart. Who is this woman? Who is this man? Not just in romantic relationships, even in just friendships. And even in, let me say it this way. I'm trying to make practical application of this. This should help you see why the sin of favoritism or discrimination or bias, why it's so dangerous. You can even get caught up in a toxic religious situation because you look at the, the pastor and he or she, you know, they look good, they dress Right, they this, that, and the other, and you say, "Oh, this must be the this must be the place." I follow them on uh, on Facebook, on Instagram, and you know, oh, they got a lot of people. Biggest devil that left hell. Why? Because you looking at this lights, you looking at the production value, you looking at how they say things, and you ain't asked God nothing. Well, Lord, what? Who is this person? Lord, show me their heart. Matter of fact, if I'm looking for a pastor, let me go and talk to them. Let me interview. What, how you treat your wife? How you treat your husband? How you do? How, you see what I'm saying? But now you so 
biased. You say, oh, I want a, I want a pastor that look good. You better read your Bible. That's what happened with <laughs> Israel. So give us a king. We want a, a tall king that look good, you know, on Instagram. Fool around, got Saul. And David was a little old. They was a little runt of the litter. He had pretty eyes, but he had no, you know. He had, and that was the best king. Now, if you want a king, I'm talking to the sisters right now. You better let God <laughs> show you the heart, and you get and ask God to give you one a man after His own heart, <laughs> a man <laughs> who has character, a man uh, who might not necessarily have all the outward trimmings. They got the inward realities. All I'm trying to say is that we have biases that we need to unpack and that we need to ask God, Lord, in every relationship situation, in every dynamic, okay, Lord, show me what's really happening here. Show me this person's heart. Show me, matter of fact, show me where I'm, um, where I'm biased or where I'm sort of um, have some unpacked things. I'm thinking right now, I'll go on and share it. Uh, when, I, when I was uh, dating, as before I got married, this is ancient history, that's why I paused. I said, let me make sure I'm remembering this right. I think I got it right. Uh, before I was, <laughs> before I got married, I had, there was a certain, I would say profile that I was attracted to a certain type of people, whatever. But after I got married, I made a commitment, me and the fellas, all of us hold each other accountable. I thank God for all my men, uh, the men in my life, um, some who might be on here right now. And we would you know, pray with each other and talk about each other, talk to each other in terms of maintaining certain boundaries. Okay, we're married now, so man, we gotta, you know, this, that, and other. But I noticed something. I said, wait a minute, I noticed that if a particular type of woman was trying to get in my space or trying to be flirty or whatever, I wouldn't shut it off as quickly as I did, you know, if it was just regular. If it's just a whole bunch of people, okay, no, nah, cut it off. No, nah, I'm married. You know, bah, 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 this, that, and that. But then I noticed, I said, wait a minute. I'm talking about how you got to ask God to search you because for what are my biases? What are my prejudices? And I started noticing if there were certain ones who sort of fit the profile of some of my old girlfriends, yeah, I cut it off. Yeah, I maintain my boundary. Yeah, I do the, you know, the little Heisman. But I was slow with it. I said, wait a minute, what's going on here? And I prayed about that thing, talked to my fellas, and the Lord revealed to me, oh, you still got something in you, some bias. You think because they look like so-and-so that they have such and such a character. When in point of fact, man, that's dangerous. That that person isn't out for your good. I said, okay, I got it, God. Now, here's all I'm saying. The practical application for this is, on a daily basis, we all need to pray Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. I, Wait a minute, Pastor. I thought you said you're supposed to pray and ask God to show you the other person. Yeah, you got to do that too. But before you get to fooling with them, <laughs> I'm the problem. Search me, O God. Y'all ain't listening. That's all right. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's where that thing starts. That's how we get rid of our prejudice. Let me let me hit another lick on this. Uh, I used to, so I have a really uh, great friend. I miss him uh, too, uh, Pastor Bob Bixby out there in California. And we would be uh, dealing with various things, you know, and, and having discussions and this, that, and the other. But it, it, it struck me because of my relationship with him that there were ways where I was sort of unconsciously biased against white people. And it would show up in certain things. And the way I sort of got a handle on it or was exposed to me you know, things would be happening. I would be dealing with, say, for example, we'd have be, be have a conflict with the police or down at City Hall doing this, that, and other. And I'd be tempted in my mind to say, these white people. And then I said, wait a minute. But what about Bob? I said, Bob, that's my dude. And so I'm getting ready to make a whole big generalization about a whole group of people 
But my, my friend Bob, you know, my, my other friend, this one, this one, that, and that, and it starts striking me, oh, wait a minute. There's something in me that I need to address. And because I have somebody close to me that can pray with me and all this kind of thing, now I can deal with my biases. I can deal with my, my discrimination that, that I'm making assumptions about other people. I got to get off of this. Uh, I see I ain't going to get done, but I got to get a lick in. <laughs> I got to get a lick in on this, <laughs> this next little piece. So I hope you, did, did you get the practical application? So we're praying, two things I've said thus far. We're praying that whenever we encounter somebody, and whether it's, whether it's a business relationship, church relationship, uh, romantic relationship, don't make no difference. Don't go by the outward appearance. Learn the reflex. God, show me. You show me who this person is. You show me this person's heart. But then on a regular basis, on a daily basis, it's not just about who they are. Ask God, search me, oh God. Know my heart. Show me where I'm, I got a bias uh, uh, against this type of person or that type of person. Against this person that doesn't speak my language. I got a bias against them. I got a bias against them. And help me to deal with that so I'm treating people the way you treat them and I see them the way you see them. But look at what else he says. He says in verses 8 through 13, let's see how far at least we can get on this. 8 through 13, if you're fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. He who said, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do commit murder, pardon me, now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And what is he talking about here? He's still dealing with this idea of partiality. And basically, what he's saying is stop making excuses for yourself, because you think that this sin is not serious. Uh, he says that the, the royal law of scripture, verse 8, is love your neighbor as yourself. Now, remember, this is connected. This is what Jesus said. When somebody said, what's the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so James is picking up on that. He says, okay, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. So don't think, and, and he uses this analogy. He says, if you're, if uh, they bring you into court and you've been arrested for uh, committing murder. Your defense can't be, yeah, but I didn't commit adultery. Well, what did I get? You committed murder. We got you on this murder count. You can't say because you didn't do this thing over here that therefore you're not guilty. And literally what he's saying is just because you didn't commit murder. Now notice how he's putting murder and adultery and discrimination on the same plane in terms of they're all sin. And he's saying, you say, well, I didn't, uh, I didn't commit murder, I didn't commit adultery, but yeah, if you did discriminate, then you've broken the law. Just like, I'm not equating that adultery and murder and discrimination are the same thing, except for the fact that all of them are violations of God's law of loving your neighbor as yourself. And if you say, well, I am loving my neighbor as myself because I didn't commit murder and I didn't commit adultery. Yeah, but you discriminated against them. So you have not loved your neighbor. You've broken the law. You've broken the, the only law that matters. And that is loving God with all your heart, mind and soul and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. You've broken the royal law of loving your neighbor when you discriminate. And your defense cannot be, well, at least I didn't murder him. What? You discriminated. You dishonored him. You dis you discounted the image of God. At least I didn't sleep with it. What? No, you discriminated against her. So let's get this last lick. I'm done. 14. He says, what uh, now through the rest of this chapter, he's going to deal with this idea of 
faith in works. And literally the argument, let me summarize what he's going to say. He says, remember, this is in the context of what is what is true religion look like? What does true Christianity look like? He's going to say, real faith manifests itself in real work. And if you're not working, now remember, he's this is in the context of him just arguing about loving your neighbor as yourself. If you're not if you have the type of faith that does not express itself in real, tangible ways, then it's a dead faith. It's not a real faith. Because if it's alive, it's going to grow. See, that's why, as much as I can, I don't like uh, fake plants. I could get some fake plants and just have plenty of them over here, and they'd look good, but they'd look the same <laughs> all their lives. I get some plants... and. Uh, these right here, I'm going to give, have to give them some attention. Got to water that one. This one a little bit sickly. But guess what? It's alive and it's growing. Because if something is real, it's going to show some signs. If it's actual, it's going to activate at some point. And so he says, let's see how he says it because I got to get this in. He says, what use is it, brethren, if someone says that he has faith but he has no works? Can that type of faith save him. Literally, he's not saying that we're saved by works. He's saying that if you are saved, you will work. Even Paul says that in Ephesians chapter uh, 2. He says, for by grace are we saved. That's chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, but what does the next verse say? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, Unto good works which he before ordained that we should uh, that we should walk in them. In other words, if you are saved, you're going to show some good works. And he says here, what use is it if you say, "Well, I have faith." He said, "Okay, well, show me your works." Which <laughs> I am a uh, apple tree. Okay, where are your apples? I, uh, I see a lot of leaves. I see some. T I am a uh, I'm a real plant. Then how come I, I don't see no growth? Matter of fact. I'd rather even see, like on this plant, it has some uh, little uh, uh, dry edges that lets me know, oh, that's a real plant. Oh, I need to water that. I'd rather see that. I was somewhere, uh, wherever I was yesterday, and I looked at a uh, uh, floral arrangement. I said, I wonder if that's real. It's so pretty. And then I looked and I saw some imperfection. I said, oh, this is real. And that made me appreciate it more made me appreciate the beauty more because I recognize, oh, this ain't plastic. So yeah, it has this little dry spot. Yeah, it has this little imperfection, but the whole thing is beautiful. Why? Because if it's real, it's going to grow even if it has some imperfections. Look at what he says here. Let's get some examples because he's still talking about the royal law and he's still connecting this back to pure religion back in chapter 1, verse 27. Here's what pure religion is. Yeah, you yeah you keep yourself unspotted, but how do you take care of people? Look at verse 15 and 16 in chapter 2. Maybe this is where I'll end. I don't think I'm going to get too much further if I can give you some uh, give you some practical applications. He says, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, and be filled. And yet you don't give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? In the same way, or even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Faith and works go together. In Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10, right here in James, in uh, all throughout scripture, in terms of Jesus, uh, not just preaching and teaching, but healing the sick, Jesus even described his ministry in Luke chapter 418. He quoted uh, Isaiah chapter 61. The Lord has anointed me. What has he anointed you to do? To open blinded eyes, to, to deal with the oppressed, to set uh, free the captives. All of that suggests that a real faith is going to show up in how you treat people. Number one, in that you will not discriminate against them. And number two, that you're not just going to give your little Christian platitudes, you know, oh, be warm and be filled, joker, stomach growling, and you complaining about you overweight. How about this? How about you live more simply so others can simply live? How about you, uh, we're in a fast right now. How about 
you make fasting a regular part of your your Christian disciplines and you take that the food that you would normally eat and stop hoarding food and actually go and donate to the uh, uh, what do we call it the food bank and all that kind of stuff you see what I'm trying to say he's saying that your faith is useless it's a dead type of faith if it's all in your head but don't never reach your hands it's all well I feel you know I feel Jesus but you don't feel nobody else's pain you oh I oh, oh I I, I love the Lord, but you don't love people. How is that? That's a dead faith. Verse 18, someone may well say, let's, let's get this. I, I, let me just at least read the rest of this, and then y'all can go back and preach it to your doggone self. Look at verse 18. Someone may well say, you have faith, but I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, <laughs> get him, James, you foolish fellow, <laughs> that faith without works is useless? <laughs> is it, now, um, let me finish reading it, and then let's, let's knock it out. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up, his, offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? When it says justified by his works, he's not using the word justified the same way that Paul used it in uh, uses it in uh, Romans or anything like that. He's basically saying that the proof of Abraham's faith was in the act of him being able to let go of his son. That proved that his faith was genuine. You see that faith working with his works and as a result of works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So he said, don't get it twisted. His righteousness was based on his faith, but his faith expressed itself in the fact that he was willing to let go of the most precious thing that he had because he loved God so much. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. That is, he's the, the proof of your, literally what he's saying is the proof of your, the authenticity of your relationship with God is not just that you say that you believe in your heart, but it's how that actual belief works itself out because if you actually believe something it's going to show up a certain type of way if you actually believe uh, that it's going to rain guess what you'll get an umbrella if you actually you know believe that the Domino's pizza man is going to get there in 30 minutes guess what actually you order it in about 30 minutes you're going to be start you're going to start looking out the out the window hey, wait a minute am I going to get a free one he said he'd be here in 30 minutes if you actually believe God, if you actually have faith in God, then it's going to show up in the way that not on, not how you talk. Oh, I believe God. I believe God. No, it's going to show up in how you act. He believed God is counted under the righteousness, but how did he act? He was willing to give up everything for God. And that's how Abraham was called the friend of God. Verse 25 he said I can give you some other examples he looked at verse 25 in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way now he's pulling an obscure uh, example but a, a useful example because he's saying that Rahab showed that she believed God by her works that is when she uh, sided with the spies that came to look you know the story is uh, it's, uh, recorded in Joshua where basically Joshua sent two spies out before they were getting ready to fight the battle of Jericho the spies encountered Rahab and Rahab something, said something very interesting she said I've heard about your God and how he dealt with the people in Egypt and we know all about that and we know y'all coming this way she said and I believe your God they said well if you really believe then do this hide us and help us get out of this thing and then when we come back around you and your family will rescue she said I believe you and she sent them away and sure enough Rahab and her family were rescued because her faith manifested itself in how she treated these spies and she wound up being in the lineage of Jesus Christ <laughs> if, you, if you read your Bible in Matthew chapter 1 and if you read the Old Testament, she became one of Jesus's great, 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 great ancestors. Well, 
he gives three examples. Abraham, he gives Rahab, and then he gives the body. Look at verse 26. The body without a spirit is dead. Your faith without works is dead. <laughs> Why? Because a body that has no animating force, that's just a corpse. You say, I got faith, but you ain't got no animation. You ain't got no works. You just dead. So all of this has been around what does real religion, what does true Christianity look like? It don't look like some of the stuff that people are passing for Christianity in the news. I'm talking about today. When I say today, I'm not talking about in this age. I'm talking about today is February 25th. You can look on the news today and people are saying things using Christ's name and using Christian jargon with stuff that ain't got nothing to do with Christianity because it's based on partiality is literally based on discrimination and it has no works attached to it. So here's your practical homework, <laughs> your practical application. Number one, ask God in whatever relationship, whatever dynamic where you're encountering, encountering people, ask God to show you who this person is. Who Show me the heart of this person. Show me who I'm dealing with because all I can see is the outside. You show me the inside. Somebody uh, is on the road uh, as you get ready to go in the store and they ask you for some change. Before you mindlessly just blow them off or mindlessly, mindlessly just give them some change. Ask God, who is this? Show me their heart. And number two, show me what you require of me in this situation. Show me who I'm dealing with and show me what you want me to do about it. That's two. Number three, on a regular basis, ask God, search me because I have some hidden prejudices. I'm prejudiced against this certain type of person. I'm biased and let this person type of person get too close just because I have um, uh, assumptions about them that might not be accurate. Search me, oh God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and see if, help me to see if my faith is a plastic plant or it's an imperfect specimen but it's still growing. That's enough for today because I got to get ready to preach children. <laughs> uh, Y'all pray for me that the Lord will help me to speak with clarity and unction today. I love you but God loves you most and I'm asking you to check in with the Holy Spirit to see if your religion is the real kind or if you've just been faking and if it's the fake now's a great time to repent and to get right with God. Well, in the meantime, we're going to come back next week. Uh-oh. Next week, we're talking about the... Oh, Lord Jesus. Next week, we're talking about the tongue. <laughs> not just the tongue, but the typing. Because, see, I'm going to deal next week with not just what we say in our personal interaction live, but in our digital interaction in the cloud. Uh, and we're going to help us as Christians to get a better handle on how we can navigate that space. God bless you and have a great day and I'll catch you a little bit later.